the most famous arguments that you hear from our Protestant interlocutors is that in the Gospel of St. Luke, you have a very clear example of sola fide, of faith alone being taught. The thief on the cross had no true chance to live out a life of repentance, never had the chance to really be baptized, to really truly confess the Lord and live a life of devotion to Christ. Thus, he merely confessed faith in Christ, and he was given salvation. Really, they say, this is the heart of the message of sola fide, of faith alone. You believe in Christ and you are saved. And thus, just as the Gospel of St. Luke says, he would be with Christ in paradise. And that really is the heart of the Gospel, we're told. And it really is a passage that gets brought up very often. And at times, Catholics get a little bit tripped up. Uh, you hear various responses that a lot of the times they're good. But a lot of the times they fall a little short. For instance, you will hear a Catholic saying, well, look, you know, he didn't have the opportunity to really be baptized. You know, he didn't have the opportunity to live that life of that walk with Christ, that that justification you get in Christ and that growing in sanctification and justification with the Lord. He didn't have the opportunity for any of that. So this is simply an exception but an exception does not make the rule. And a lot of the times when we hear that, a lot of those things are true. They really are true. But I think really, we really get to the heart of the issue of what is going on in the gospel of St. Luke? What is going on in the gospels with the thief on the cross that confesses Christ? And if we really look at what is going on here, I think if we actually look at the language, we look at the text, we realize that rather than support the doctrine of faith alone, it really doesn't at all. Rather, it supports the ancient Catholic teaching. But then you may be wondering, well, what ancient Catholic teaching are you talking about, William? Well, if you look at Luke 23, which we're going to do now, and we're going to break it down, it begins with one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, Christ, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other responded, rebuking him and said, do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly for we are receiving what we deserve for our crimes. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So a number of very important things we've got to break down here. Number one, there is one criminal who is clearly diabolical, evil, mocking the Christ, as was predicted in the, in the book of wisdom. But the other one rebukes the diabolical one and tells him, do you not even fear God? Now, that is incredible. At times, we tend to gloss over this. And people tend to think, well, is he referring to fearing God the Father? Is What is he referring to here? No, it seems very clearly that he's confessing the Christ to be God. Do you not even fear God? Since you're under the same condemnation, that is significant. You're under the same sentence of condemnation. Yet you're mocking God here. He seems to be filled with some incredible wisdom. And we indeed are suffering justly for we receiving what we deserve for our crimes. But this man has done nothing wrong. Incredible. So he knows the Christ has done nothing wrong. He knows the Christ is God. He confesses the Christ. And he fears God, which is indicative of everything in the text. He fears God. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That is the key. He recognizes that the Christ will have a kingdom, but it will not be an earthly one. 
He knows that it's a heavenly kingdom. He's filled with this incredible wisdom, which shows us he had knowledge prior. It doesn't matter if it was if it was at that exact moment or a day or a week or whatever before. That doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is he knows that he's the Christ. He knows he's God, and he fears God. Fear here is used as a verb. He fears God. There's nothing here, nothing even remotely resembling faith alone. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The Son of Man has a kingdom. Almighty God has a kingdom in heaven. And he knows that this is Almighty God who has a kingdom in heaven and Almighty God on the cross. He tells him, you don't even fear God. You're under the same sentence of condemnation. Well, God on the cross is under a sentence of condemnation. He's confessing them to be God. This is not merely faith alone. You may say, well, faith alone, part of that is confessing them to be merely God, well, to be an uh, incredible God. Well, he, he has fear of the, of the Lord as well. He has fear of God. He confesses them to be God, but he also has fear of God. And we'll read in a moment, by the way, fear of God is used as a verb here. But we're going to look in a moment, which is very important. And of course, fear will be used as a verb here, of course. Don't want somebody to come back and say, well, of course, William, we recognize that. We're just trying to bring out the nuances of the text. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The son of man, almighty God has a kingdom. He knows those details. Be blown away. He knows those details. If we recognize all that and we soak that in, do you not even fear God? He has the fear of the Lord. He fears God. This is significant. This is a significant text. But what does the Bible tell us about fear of the Lord? In, in a Greek standard, Donker's Greek New Testament lexicon, for Luke 23, 40 in particular, the Greek word for fear, the Greek word for fear, fabe here, the Greek word fabeo, to have deep respect for human or for God as the highest entity. And it has Luke 23, 40 referenced here. He has deep respect. That's what fear of the Lord is. Deep respect for the highest entity. Don't tell me this is merely faith alone. No, he acted upon that faith confessed him to be almighty God and is acting upon that faith is having a deep respect for God almighty as the highest entity confesses him to be almighty God. This isn't merely a belief, a faith alone or a confession alone. No, he doesn't only confess him as almighty God. He has fear of the Lord. He has fear of God. That's very clear from the text as we break it down. That's very clear. In fact, in Luke 150, it says, his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. His mercy. It's for those who fear him. So the Lord gives mercy for those who fear him. In Psalm 111.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, a good understanding. Have all those who do his commandments, his praise endures forever. So part of following the work of the Lord, part of following the commandments of God, part of, part of following the work of God, it's to fear the Lord, because that's a deep respect. What is the first commandment? I am the Lord thy God, that I shall not have any other strange gods before me. I am the Lord thy, thy God, is the first commandment. You should have a deep respect and reverence for the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. So very clearly, fear of the Lord 
shows that one has a possession of some kind of wisdom. And if you fear the Lord, you are doing a work of the Lord. Fearing the Lord is a good work. Fearing the Lord is a good work. You have reverence for the highest deity. His praise endures forever. So let us be careful. Let's not pay heed when we hear, well, fear of the Lord, and just gloss over it. And then here, well, the thief on the cross merely had faith alone, merely believed, and that was it. In a moment, we'll go over what the early church fathers had to say, but there's much more going on there in the text. And when we break down every text that our Protestant interlocutors utilize for faith alone, we find that they all fail when trying to put forth the doctrine of faith alone. None of them succeed shouldn't shock you. The Bible doesn't teach sola fide. The early fathers didn't teach sola fide. None of the early local councils or later ecumenical ones ever taught anything remotely resembling what Martin Luther would later create, concoct. Unfortunately, from the pits of his deranged mind, Lord have mercy upon us all. Lord, never allow any of us to become so arrogant as to allow us to concoct a teaching that goes against the very heart and soul of the gospel. He was an Augustinian monk. And he didn't care that he was opposing the very namesake of his order, the great St. Augustine, one of the greatest doctors and pillars of the faith. So this is what the fear of the Lord is. It is a work of God. Those who do his commandments have it. The Bible's clear about that. It is an essential. And the thief on the cross had it. So it really does help to understand all of these elements. And when you are able to grasp them, then you realize how the idea of sola fide really doesn't make any sense. And perhaps even more importantly, it is nowhere in the minds of any of the authors of sacred scripture. They would have never envisioned such a teaching that would be concocted later on in history by Martin Luther. Just really wouldn't have made sense for any of them. We have to really emphasize that. It just really wouldn't have made sense for any of them. It wasn't present in the Old Testament wasn't present in the New Testament either. And it clearly is not present in this figure, the suffering figure on the cross, the thief that confesses our Lord and has the fear of the Lord. Indeed, Psalm 25 tells us, all the paths of the Lord are faithfulness and truth to those who comply with his covenant and his testimonies. Then look at this. For the sake of your name, Lord, forgive my wrongdoing, for it is great. Who is the person who fears the Lord? He will instruct them in the way he should choose. His soul will dwell in prosperity. His descendants will inherit the land. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him. You catch that? Those who fear the Lord, they have the secret of the Lord. And he will make them know his covenant. So it's very clear when you read of one possessing the fear of the Lord, it's not faith alone. It's much more than that. Now, do we mean that he was baptized in the normal manner and walked a full life of, uh, with Christ? Not at all. We're not saying that. But we're showing that the thief on the cross did not possess faith alone according to the way it was laid out by the reformers. And we will see how the belief of the thief on the cross is diametrically opposed. The interpretation of the thief on the cross and his faith and his fear of the Lord, the reformer's interpretation is diametrically opposed to that of the clear testimony of the scriptures and the very clear testimony of sacred tradition in the early fathers. He will make them know his covenant. My eyes are continually toward the Lord. 
for he will rescue my feet from the net. What do the fathers have to say? We'll see in a moment. But keep in mind that in Luke 23, we read, do you not even fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, he confessed Christ as God, and he showed that he was in possession of fear of the Lord. This is not faith alone. This is not faith alone. And indeed, Prudentius tells us, water and blood flow out from the pierced sides of the Savior. Blood indicates the victory. Water stands for baptism. The two robbers on crosses on each side dispute with each other. One denies Christ as God, but the other wins heavenly glory. Now, how does he win heavenly glory? He confesses Christ to be the God. He confesses that Christ is God. Notice how Prudentius clearly tells us in his scenes from sacred history that the other thief denies that Christ is almighty God, yet the other one does recognize that he's almighty God. St. Maximus of Turin says the penitent thief considered the cross of Christ not to be a stumbling block, but power rightly merits paradise. So there's a penitent thief. The same apostle says, to those Jews who have been called Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, the Lord also correctly gives paradise to him. You catch that? To those who have been called Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, the Lord also correctly gives paradise to him because on the gibbet of the cross, the thief confesses the one whom Judas Iscariot had sold in the garden. The thief confesses the one whom the disciple denied. This is a remarkable thing, I say. The thief honors the one who suffers. Notice how we pointed how that fear of the Lord is, the, uh, is a kind of honor. It is a following of the commandments of the Lord, a following of the paths of the Lord, albeit in a limited manner because he didn't have a full life to live, but he does. He does confess the Lord and shows himself to be a believer Right there on the cross, of course, he's going to be saved. Of course, he's going to be saved. This is a remarkable thing, I say. The thief honors the one who suffers, while Judas betrayed the one who kissed him. The one peddled flattering words of peace, and the other preached the wounds of the cross. He says, remember me, Lord, when you come in your kingdom. Pope St. Leo the Great, one of the greatest Christologists ever, the very beating heart of Chalcedon was the tome of Leo. Remember that. The beating heart of Chalcedon was the tome of Leo. He says, until now, one, the thief, was the equal in all things of his companion. He was a robber on the roads and always a danger to the safety of people. Deserving the cross, he suddenly becomes a confessor of Christ. He acts out, confesses Christ. Remember me, Lord, when you enter into your kingdom. Then came the gift in which faith itself received a response. Did you catch that? Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. This promise surpasses a human condition because it did not come so much from the wood of a cross as from a throne of power. From that height, he gives a reward to faith. There he abolishes the debt of human transgression because the form of God did not separate itself from the form of a servant. Even in the middle of this punishment, both the inviolable divinity and the suffering human nature preserved its own character and its own oneness. You're not going to get better theology. You're not going to get better Christology than you're going to get from Pope St. Leo the Great. You're not. All of this, as we point out, is incredibly important, incredibly and vitally important, because we are emphasizing that the idea put forth by Luther and the Reformers and modern-day modern day Protestants is a very clearly problematic theology. You don't find it in the Bible. You don't find it in the early fathers either. Now, before we're done with the show, we're going to look at what Martin Luther had to say. And I'd like you to compare it to what we've looked at so far from the Bible and compare it to what we've looked at as well in the early fathers. I think that's going to be... Important as well, does what Luther had to say, you know, does it match up with what the fathers say as well? Pope Gregory the Great in his Moralia says, On the cross, nails had fastened his hands and feet, and nothing remained free from torture but his heart and tongue. Notice, his heart had been converted. 
His heart can be converted and he confesses Christ as God. By the inspiration of God, the thief offered him the whole which he found free. That as it is written, with a heart he might believe unto righteousness. With a mouth he might confess unto salvation. But the three virtues with the, which the apostle speaks of, the thief suddenly filled with grace, both received and preserved in the cross. He had faith, for example, who believed that God would reign whom he saw dying equally with himself. He had hope who asked for an entrance into his kingdom. He, and he preserved charity also zealously in his death, who for his iniquity reproved his brother and fellow thief, dying for a like crime to his own. Anywhere you look throughout church history, you're going to find the early fathers echoing the fact that he had a contrite heart, clearly had shown signs of conversion, confessed Christ to be Lord, God Almighty, had fear of the Lord. This is clearly, clearly not faith alone, sola fide, the way the reformers try to sell you their version of faith alone. And to that, we, we want to look at what the reformers had to say. And you've got it right here. In Luther's commentary to the Galatians, he tells us, Hereby it appears that the doctrine of the gospel, which of all others is most sweet and full of most singular consolation, speaks nothing of our works or of the works of the law. Did he catch that? Nothing of our works. Even though we're told in the Bible that it is a following of the commandments of God, a following of the ordinances of God, to have fear of the Lord. We're told to have fear of the Lord. He says that, hey, this is very clearly, he's going to use the thief on the cross as an example of faith alone. Look at that. Even though the Bible tells you otherwise, even though the fathers tell you otherwise, nothing of our works or of the works of the law, we agree there, but of the inscrutable mercy and love of God towards most wretched and miserable sinners, we agree there. Our most merciful father, seen as to be oppressed and overwhelmed with the curse of the law, and that we could never be delivered from it of our own power, sent his only son into the world, and laid upon him all the sins of all men, saying, Be you Peter that denier, Paul that persecuted and cruel oppressor, David that adulterer, that sinner who did eat the fruit in Eden, that thief who hanged upon the cross. And be thou that person who has committed the sins of all me. See therefore that thou pay and satisfy for them. So, what Luther wants you to believe is that the doctrine of the gospel is faith alone. He tells you right there, nothing of our works, nothing of our works, nothing of them. But the Bible actually tells you, actually says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments, who do his commandments, so very clearly, fear of the Lord is connected with doing the will of God. It's connected with doing the will of God. And you look here, fear, fabe, fear, is to have deep respect as the highest entity for God. For God. He confessed him to be Almighty God. And he had the highest respect as well. And we're told that those that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding, which he had a perfect understanding of it, have all those who do his commandments. Are you going to tell me he didn't do a command of the Lord? Of course he did. He had fear of the Lord. Now, we're not arguing that he got baptized and did all kinds of works of penitence. We don't know. We simply don't know. But we know that he possessed the fear of the Lord. And that is quite significant. That's very significant. We emphasize that over and over. So to tell us that you know, he didn't have this, you know, it, it, it truly is problematic. And I want to be very clear for the audience that when I look at the text, you know, every time, you know, every time I examine it and looking at it right now, I'm popping it up. 
Yeah, I'm baffled. Now, I want to be very clear. Modern day Protestantism, modern day Protestantism tries to give a different spin on the belief of faith alone. You find it very often. But the classical Reformed view, the classical view of Luther, as you saw, very clearly a faith alone, as Luther says. Yeah, faith alone. No sign of any kind of work, even though the Bible says fear of the Lord is a good understanding of wisdom and a sign that you do follow the commands of the Lord. Now, we don't believe he follows all the commandments, but you follow the commands of God in the sense of you have feared the Lord. He recognized Christ to be Lord. I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not have any false gods before me. He recognized Christ to be Almighty God, the very clear command of God. He had a good grasp of it. By the way, that thief on the cross classically has been understood to be St. Dismas, who was the thief that was repentant, the one who the Lord said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now, for some that say, well, you know, what about purgatory, what have you? We don't know if he underwent an instantaneous purification. We have known nothing else about him. Other than there, what we read, we don't know. We don't know anything. But to claim that the faith alone is taught here uh, is pretty, pretty wild. I got to be very clear. You know, nothing, nothing about anything about him other than he had fear of the Lord. He knew Christ was almighty God. That is incredible. Very, very incredible. Now, does it give us indication that maybe he had been following the ministry of Christ? Maybe he had some kind of catechesis, as would have been said by St. Cyril of Jerusalem in his mystagogical lectures, noting that some people did have certain levels of catechesis. It's possible. How else would he have known that Christ was Almighty God, had a kingdom that wasn't of this earth, and had fear of the Lord? To think that he would have not known any of that it really does make much of the text. It makes much, much of it. But it doesn't fit in with faith alone, I'll tell you that much. He had much more than simply faith alone. He confessed Christ to be Almighty God, and he had fear of the Lord. Uh, very clearly, despite his clear limitations. Now, all of this is important because I emphasize over and over how modern-day Protestantism continues to move further and further away, not only from apostolic Christianity, but e even move further and further away from the faith of the Reformers. You know, the early Reformers believed certain things that modern-day Protestants don't believe. And that's a problem for modern-day Protestants, I'll tell you that right now. But another thing that I'll tell you is that we're going to be doing more of these videos like this, where I'm going to try to stick to about 30 to 40 minutes. You get to the heart of the matter, we'll look at the text, exegete it grammatically, we'll look at the Greek or Hebrew when relevant. And then we'll look at the early fathers as well, bite-sized portions. I mean, we could have looked at way more fathers, but, you know, you get the point. And then, of course, we'll look at Greek lexicons, Greek dictionaries, and what have you, to hopefully edify you. Now, if you've been edified, do me a huge favor. Down below, smash the like and flood the comment section for the algorithm. You, you are the reason that our channel grows. You're the reason that our channel is growing, blowing up. You are that reason. And I cannot thank you enough from the bottom of my heart. Now, if you're a member already, if you're a patron already, then you have seen all of the incredible exclusive patron-only events that we have going on. January, February, where you can interact with myself and scholars and behind-the-scenes events. Courses, scholarly courses that are exclusive to, to patron members. And, uh, so consider becoming a supporter in whatever way you can, if you are able to. But above all, remember to pray for me and remember that I will be praying for you. And if you've enjoyed the show today, if you've enjoyed it, if you're a Protestant, maybe you don't fully agree, but you enjoyed the show, or if you are a convert, or if you are a Catholic and you love the show, let me know down below what you thought of the show. Were you edified? Were you filled with the joy and the love that can only be found through our Lord and Savior Christ, through our triune God? Hope you were, and I hope to see you again soon. God bless you. God keep you. Pray for me. We pray for you.